And another person that wrote in that you got to work with was Tom Cito. I just had Tom on again not too long ago. We went in depth. Wow. And uh, I don't know if you remember, because you have so many interactions on social media, but I asked you a couple weeks ago, or maybe about last week, you had posted a little bit of animation with uh, John Smith from Pocahontas. And I said, where does this one rank as far as your career goes for right. accolades, right? right? So you broke it down and you gave me your top four. Um, and then that led me to going over and talking to Tom. I'm like, hey, I got John coming on this week. You got any cool stories I should bring up with him? And he's like, one comes to mind in particular. <laughs> so he was <laughs> like... <laughs> They said, okay, I worked with John on Pocahontas. He did John Smith to Glenn Keane's Poca. When we were going over the end of the song, Colors of the Wind, and I think you know where this is going, uh, what song Colors of the Wind, where they are just about to kiss, but stop before their lips touch. We kept teaching them, or he's like, we kept teasing them both. He said, I'm not sure what you mean here. Can you guys act out this scene? So he was talking about you and Glenn, trying to get you and Glenn to kiss out John Smith and Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, I, I like sharing those little things. You got anything you'd like to say to Tom about the, him trying to bring that up? <laughs> Boy, I totally forgot about that. But you know what? It brings, it brings up several interesting ideas. First of all, for an animator to animate something that has authenticity, Julia, it's important that they become that which they are creating on paper. So... Glenn had to be Pocahontas. Whatever the feminine side is that he could muster up, he had to be the Native American princess, he had to be a woman, he had to be athletic, he had to be gorgeous, he had to be all the things that he was putting onto paper and to make it convincing. I likewise had to do my research about John Smith. You know, I found out all kinds of information. I've read his diaries. And so I had to fill myself up with the John Smith experience and become him mm -hmm. in order to be authentic with the animation I was creating. Otherwise it would look robotic and generic and you wouldn't have cared. And hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week I sit down with legendary animator, Mr. John Pomeroy. We chat about All Dogs Go to Heaven, one of my personal favorite movies as a kid and as an adult. It hits so much deeper as an adult. Watching the movies with a live audience, where his love for animation started, spoiler alert, it was Bambi, and so much more. This episode is extremely special to me for so many reasons, and I really hope you all enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian. Today, I'm joined by animation legend, Mr. John Pomeroy. John, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Thank you. No problem, man. Like I said, I've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. Now, I just, uh, I sent you... A little something because you started doing um commissions not too long ago i saw it on your instagram page so i put one in there so i don't know if you've gotten a chance to read what i wrote and i went back and i was like i really wish i would have proofread what i put in there uh but i'm a really big fan of all dogs go to heaven at a young age i lost a dog uh i was very very distraught like most little kids are whenever they lose their pet uh, but after seeing All Dogs Go to Heaven, that gave me hope that wherever Stripe was, because that was my dog's name back then, wherever Stripe was, I knew he was going to be okay because Charlie and Itchy were doing just fine in the movie I saw the little kids. So you guys helped me bridge a gap that most most parents think that oh, they're too young for death. So you guys helped me get past losing my first dog with that movie, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Um, so thank you for that, man. So uh, I would love to know. Where did all dogs go to heaven? Where did that start? Obviously, Don Blue Studios is coming into that one. You're a big part of Don Blue Studios. But uh, how did that one come about? How did that one get started? Uh, that was a story concept that Don came up with. Um, and I remember him speaking openly about that. Oh, boy. I guess it must have been sometime after um, uh, Secret of Nim. Mm -hmm. Right around there, he, he mentioned the idea for a, a story about all dogs go to heaven. And I think it's, it came up uh, from his, something from his childhood. Um, I think they had a dog and either the dog was killed or it died. And one of his relatives says, well, don't worry, Don, you know, all dogs go to heaven. This was kind of the little little idea that had been kicking around in his mind, this little uh, theology, uh, grace 
moment that he had with a relative. And uh, I guess that idea just generated a story in his head, just a real basic plot line. So I, we began working on All Dogs Go to Heaven. I think we were in Ireland in that time. Uh, we had started our, um, uh, our studio there in November of 1986. So I think right around the time we were finishing up Land Before Time, we started work on a basic concept. We hired writers to kind of put some meat on the bones that Don had already formulated in his mind. So that's how it kind of began. Yeah, like I said, as a young kid, man, I really enjoyed that one. You brought up a movie and we'll we'll jump around just a little bit because I want to make sure we sure. have a fan base for each one. Uh, but Land Before Time, I'm pretty sure I've had I've talked about it on this podcast. Please don't take this as an insult, John, because like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. Land Before Time. Oh man, as a kid, my younger brother had that one. We had the VHS, right? Before we had the VHS, uh, every week my mom would take us to go to Blockbuster and we'd rent a movie. And right. each, each other week we would alternate on who got to pick a movie and who didn't. So my younger brother and my younger sister, anytime it was their time to pick two times a month, they were picking that first Land Before Time on VHS. I, I don't know how many times I watched it, but I remember I was like, oh my God. And like I said, John, please don't take this the wrong way. I was like, I was so glad the meteor hit. I was like, I'm so glad dinosaurs aren't here anymore, right? Because I just, I could not get past little, but it just killed me so much to watch it. And then as I get older, right, as I start having kids, so I got a 12 year old and then we have a 10 month old, right? And uh, I was gone for a pretty big portion of my oldest life uh, for deployments and stuff like that. First four years of his life, I was gone uh, for the first four years, really. And uh, when I come back, he's watching this movie. And the first thing I think of, I'm like, oh, damn. Or at this point, I have to I have to relive all of this trauma that I had with my younger brother, right? So we're watching this and I was like, holy shit, man, I judged this one so unfairly as a kid because my younger brother and younger sister watched it so much. And I'm watching this movie and I'm watching my, my oldest son, Hayden, he's watching it and he fell in love with these dinosaurs. And then through him, I fell in love with these dinosaurs. I, I left that, that, uh, that dislike, I guess, at such a young age for these dinosaurs. And that was such a fun movie, too. We'll get back to that one in just a second, man. But uh, for All Dogs Go to Heaven, let's stay on that one for just a little bit. Uh, when you're working on this, do you have a favorite scene that you animated on for this one? Or you have a favorite character that, that just felt like a nice pair of shoes that you slipped into? Wow. Um, there's, there's a few scenes. Um, there's uh, the one sequence where uh, Itchy and Charlie are trying to put uh, Anne-Marie to bed. And, and they've talked about what they're going to be doing as far as their next big con at the racetrack. But they need to get her to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so um, he's reading her a storybook. A story book. Um, and... <laughs> The, the book he's reading from, he's, he's reading the story of Robin Hood. But you see the book from the backside, and it's War and Peace upside down. So he's kind of just making this thing up as he goes in the hopes of getting her sleepy, that she'll finally go to sleep. But, but, I mean, that whole little sequence right there is just, I thought it was a real golden moment as far as personality development, where the character's heart is, and what she's all about as a character. Um, she's kind of, she kind of harkens back to a movie that I love uh, when I was growing up, a movie with Bob Hope called uh, Sorrowful Jones. It's a Damon Runyon story. And it's about, you know, bookies and what their life is around the racetrack. Mm -hmm. And this mentality that kind of surrounds and imbues that kind of character is what Charlie's all about. He's all about himself about making it big, making a lot of money and being the top dog. And so he'll do whatever it takes to get to that place. Yeah. Uh, whether it means, you know, uh, employing a little girl who he refers to as the little brat, yeah. you know, and getting her to sleep. So that's all he's thinking about. Um, what happens is something in, about this little girl touches Charlie and he begins a emotional journey with her uh it's the kind of emotional journey as a parent we all have 
uh, when we have our firstborn child. It's like we're giving up the old life that we had as an independent individual person, and we're now li living for someone else. Yeah. And so we become involved with the word others. And I think that's what Charlie was running into, even in this early sequence in the taxi cab where he's trying to get Anne Marie uh, to bed. And there was a nice little moment where he uh, puts her in the front seat, closes a divider curtain, hoping that she'll just fall asleep. And what happens is she's talking out loud and she decides to say her prayers. Mm -hmm. And he hears her, hears Anne Marie praying to God for him. Yeah. And I think that touches him. It's only implied. It's just not shown up front, but it's implied. And she represents kind of a purity that he doesn't have in his life. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely little sequence. And uh, that sequence is probably one of my favorite that I got to work on in the sequence. Another one is a sequence later on where she gets adopted by this young couple. He tries to go and con her back. I mean, he's lost his meal ticket. And he um, goes outside the window where she's having her breakfast waffles for the first time. Yeah. And uh, he is feigning that he is mortally sick, that he needs her. Uh, but it's okay. He's willing to sacrifice not having her so she can have a better life. But if she's willing to come back with him, he would really appreciate it. That was a fun sequence also. So there's two, two right there. Man, thank you for breaking that down. Oh, now sure. One thing I absolutely love when you guys when you guys come on here and you and you tell me stories about the production side of the movies or the TV shows you had on. Uh, I don't know if you remember a show. You remember a show called Rugrats on Nickelodeon back in the day? Yeah. Yes. So I had Paul Germain on not too long ago. He's co-creator, and uh, he was he was talking about how when they were filling the room for like the writing room uh, to write the Rugrats show. They were really looking for people that were young parents, first time parents and stuff like that. That way they could take little stories like, oh, you know, Johnny spilled this. So that's why this one in it. So they were looking for like firsthand experience. With a movie like this, obviously, you know, everybody kind of has a dog. Everybody's lost a dog, I'm pretty sure. Once you become an adult, you've lost a dog. But with the projects you've worked on, would you guys look at trying to fill artists or writers for specific movies? Like, so all dogs go to heaven. I'm not saying you want to go out and get only people that have had dogs, but does that question make any sense to you? So you're asking if we try to hire writers that have a empathy with the plot line and understand that from their own personal experience. Yeah. How does that, how does that process work for you when you're looking for a writer or an animator and you get a specific story in mind, like say like all dogs go to heaven. Is there anything that you guys are looking for or are you guys just trying to get bodies in there and then you guys are going to mold the story that way? You know what? It's uh, Julian, it's kind of serendipitous sometimes because you, you look for a writer, obviously, that's got the kind of ability that you that you think would work for that type of story. Mm -hmm. um, you look at their track record, you look at the things that they have might have written before. We got kind of a false start with a set of writers who I won't mention their names right now that for about the first six months of production, they we thought we were uh, we had the right team and it turned out we didn't. Yeah. Um, the things that they wrote were kind of hollow, uh, didn't have any soul or spirit to them. They just didn't quite ring true with us. So uh, we eventually let them go because we felt we were running into a brick wall. And then we ran, uh, hired another writer who I can't remember. We saw the script that they had written. Um, Dave Weiss is his name. And he, uh, he came to us uh, uh, while we were in Dublin, Ireland. And we just hit it off. There was a right chemistry that just happened. And um, obviously, the writing of the story is the most important component mm -hmm. of any kind of storytelling, whether it's live action or animation. With a great story, you can tell it with sock puppets. Yeah. I mean, good story is, is an enigma. How it happens, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I've been involved with... Uh, writing stories with my two partners and with other projects. Uh, and it's a slippery bar of soap. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you've got a great writing partner, it makes all the difference in the world. And um, Dave Weiss just had, I don't know, he had something that um, 
that was complementary to Don, myself, and Gary, and the way we thought, the way we pre present ideas, he could take something and further it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, just, it just seemed to work. It, had, it was just the right chemistry, the right synergy. And he began writing that first sequence. Uh, I think the first sequence he did write was the taxi sequence that I just described to you. And it just, it just rang true. It just had truth. It had authority. Uh, it had resonance. Uh, anybody we would read the sequence to and try it out, it would start crying. Yeah. So based on that, we just went further and further and further into the story. The, uh, uh, the bones of the story, like I described earlier, were set into place by Don and myself and Gary. Don's idea about this dog, this con dog, came from him and his childhood experience. And our writer just kind of put some extra meat on that and more and fleshed it out. And it just it just took off. Uh, it was a great experience. Um, and as we started to climb into the animation, it started to make sense as we cast the voices of Charlie and Itchy, which were uh, Burt Reynolds and Don DeLuise. They had worked together before in previous other films together. They already had a chemistry and that played into our concept about Charlie and his partner, Itchy. And it just kept getting better and better and better and better. It really was. And no pun intended, man, those two were a match made in heaven, man. I, really, <laughs> I, I, liked, I liked the way, looking at it now, man, when was the last time you watched this movie? Oh, wow. I think a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, so I cook for a living, right? So whenever I have people over, I love to cook for them. I love to feed them. It's very, very, it's very cathartic in a sense. I'm pretty sure you got, you right. got hobbies that, of yourself that you like to do. Um, but cooking for somebody is so personal, right? You get to really see the likes and dislikes that somebody have. But whenever I feed somebody, I know everything that's wrong with whatever I just fed them. Like, oh, it needed more salt. It needed more this. It needed more that. When you sit down and you watch a movie that you worked on, can you enjoy it? for what it is or are you consistently picking out like man we should have done we should have tweaked it a little bit here what's it like watching one of your movies with you uh a lot of times it's a surprise party yeah it's not just a meal it's a surprise party animators as well as directors in animation everybody involved in animation it's it's kind of a solo performance i mean you as an animator are in a room by yourself facing in my case, I'm not working digitally. I work on pencil and paper. I'm a dinosaur. I still love <laughs> working that way. But I mean, you're creating all of these images and personalities and life forms just by yourself, you and that empty pad of paper. Mm -hmm. And then at some point after it's completed, you get to sit in the hollow halls of a darkened theater and you hear that audible response to scenes that you created. And there's nothing like it, Julian. You're hearing the audible cries and sniffs or the gnashing of teeth and anger or the laughter at moments that you created. And that is your great reward for all of the headache and all the trouble that you spent in animating that scene. That's where your reward comes in. There's nothing like it. So with all the movies that you've worked on, uh, you've, you, I'm assuming you've seen every single one of them with a crowd of people. Maybe you snuck in or. No, not, uh, not all of them. Some of them, um, like Pebble and the Penguin, I was so thoroughly burned out as a producer from wearing the producer's hat. I never got to see the entire movie in its completion. So and it happens. Sometimes there are movies. I'm sure if, uh, if you were to put that question to some of the great directors from the past, you know, like a John Ford or a Frank Cabra, you know, what's your what's your favorite movie? They'll gladly tell you, oh, it's such and such. What's your worst movie? And they'll just <laughs> they'll hold up some moment that was just a tragedy in their life and they don't want to have anything to do with it. But with me, it's like uh, the last two or three movies, Pebble and the Penguin was one of them. I have not seen that in its entirety. So well, the only reason I ask that question is what is. And it doesn't have to be a it doesn't have to be a laugh or anything like that specifically. But what is the biggest reaction to any of the movies that you've actually gotten to sit on with, you know, a cast out in the wild? What's the biggest reaction? Do you remember whether it's cries, laughing, anger? And you remember what movie it might have been? 
Yeah, the uh, the death of Littlefoot's mother. <laughs> Ooh, I got to imagine that one hits pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, that's that that goes neck and neck with the uh, the death of Bambi's mother. Only in this case, you never saw Bambi's mother getting shot. You actually see Littlefoot's mother die. Yeah. And uh, before she expires, she is trying to give him information that he's going to need for his ne- life, next life experience. Yeah. And it's a really touching little moment. Her clo- the head of mom is there right next to uh, crouching little foot, listening to her every word. He doesn't, doesn't understand what death is yet. Yeah. And all he knows is that his mother is not with him any longer. And he's so um, scarred by that, that uh, in the following sequence, he mistakens a shadow that the light cast from his own body he mistakens that for his mother and he runs frantically oh, joyously up to this giant rock and he starts to lick it and he realizes oh that's just me so i would say that that one moment more audibly than any other i tell you what the second one is though uh, i did a film for disney uh, a few years after that which was fantasia 2000 mm-hmm. And it was the Firebird sequence where the sprite comes over the edge of this burnt out volcano cauldron and goes to the core of the cauldron and reaches out slowly and touches it. And suddenly, bam, there is this musical chord and these eyes open. And suddenly this thing, massive, horrible looking, glowing thing grows out of this cauldron that she is mistakenly open. That's another moment that's... I, I, <laughs> I, I saw the audience jump three feet out of, out of their seats. I bet you that's got to feel good. Those two, those two interactions or those two reactions in particular, do you instantly think, Don, we got him or Disney, we got him? What was that? What was that initial like thought going on in your head? Like, oh, man, this is this is crazy. It, it, it's just. Um... For me, I think what you do is you kind of give yourself a pat on the back because the the moment was designed either to produce shock or produce emotion, and you succeeded. You start out with kind of a an equation that the story person puts together, and it's and it's further empowered by the story sketch artist, and it's further empowered by your own pencil animation. That's further empowered by the way it's colored, and then the music that goes along with it. Every animated moment you think of is actually told in three or four other instances. You tell the story in story, you tell it in story sketch, you tell it in animation and movement, you tell it in color, you tell it in in music, and of course you tell it in the audio and the dialogue. And all of these things have to engage and come together for one given moment. And we're always looking for that moment that we, um, I call it the willing suspension of disbelief, that you as the audience in the, in the theater absolutely believe what is happening on the screen. And that's what produces the shock. And when it happens, hot diggity, you're, you're delighted. And I can imagine, man. And that, that scene you just descri- uh, described with, uh... With Littlefoot and his mother, that might have been the first time I actually cried in front of my oldest son. And I remember well, him looking like you know, that. Okay. You know, uh, Julian, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's kind of one of the things that actually prepared, propelled me in animation. I remember my parents taking me when I was 14 years old to see Bambi, and I wanted to see the Beatles and Hard Day's Night. Yeah. Now I was really in a mood. I was sitting there in the theater with my arms crossed. And I'm watching <laughs> Bambi, this wimpy deer, like in the movie Sandlot. <laughs> what, that wimpy deer? <laughs> and I find myself getting emotionally charged and starting to cry mm-hmm. at the death of this little wimpy deer's mother. Mm-hmm. And I, I, afterward, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. I was crying. I was trying to hide the tears. And... And then I realized what a powerful medium this is that would cause me to do a complete emotional turnaround from being rebellious to empathy to just crushed. Yeah. That this animated drawing has just caused me to go through this catharsis. 
what a medium. It's yeah. amazing. It really is, man. And now, now that's a running joke. Whenever my son and I go to movies, they're like, man, I wonder how long it's going to take for dad stars. I don't know if it's just in my older age or, you know, I don't know what it is, but it seems like I'm a little bit more sentimental. I'm a little bit more emotional because just like that little foot moment, that moment, you could see that as a kid and feel really sad that little foot lost his mom. And then you look at that as an adult or an parent and you're like, shit, man, all, I'm going to miss out on everything on this kid's life as, as the wow. lights go out for, you know, the lights come on and the lights go out for the last time for you. And you're looking at your kid and you're thinking, I'm going to miss everything with him. It just, it hits on such a different level as an adult. And like I said, I think that's why I appreciate that movie. I couldn't appreciate it when I was younger because of how many times I was subjected to watching it as a little kid. I was like, I always wanted to watch something new. That was the best part about going to Blockbuster, getting to pick, like going to the movies. I've said it so many times on this podcast. It's like my equivalent to going to Disney World for a little kid, getting to go to the theaters, getting to go to Blockbuster, getting to pick something out because you're going on it. It's like getting a book. You're going to go on an adventure, right? You're going to learn right. something going to see something new something's going to happen you're going to have that emotion that all the animators chase man just anger sadness happiness joy all of this crazy stuff right so looking at that like i said through a parent's eyes it hit so much harder man sure. now we're almost to the time we got to to the time we got to go but uh next time next time you come on i'd love to have you back on and i do it right with you, man, because like I said, when I introduced you as a legend, I absolutely meant that, man. I've listened to, to so many of the podcasts from Bancroft Brothers podcast that you were on. You're whole in depth from the walkout to, to what you're doing now and everything in between. I've been so fascinated with because one thing I love about people you bet on yourself, right? Nobody is going to hype you up. Nobody is going to sit there and promote you as much as you will promote you. And you guys, you three in particular that walked out that day, and you guys had some animators and writers came with you, but you three in particular, you guys bet on yourself. And I, I love that tenacity. I love that spirit. I love that rebellious stage you were just talking about when you had to be taken to Bambi and you had that that change of emotion right i love that that rebellion man it, it's just something about that is so fascinating um so like i said i would love to have you back on down the road so we can go a little bit more in sure. depth absolutely um so i've actually had a few of your friends write in whenever i have somebody coming on i say hey i've got such and such coming on I open it up to the fans questions so the fans submitted some stuff but some of your colleagues and some of your friends have also wrote uh, wrote and or told me stories to bring up with you one in particular sandro cluzo wanted me to tell you hello you are <laughs> his episode will come out in just a couple weeks uh that man was so amazing so happy like i i was talking to him and i was going through I, i've been going through some stuff lately some family stuff and some personal stuff talking to him for i think we talked for like an hour and a half almost two hours i felt so happy and so with joy and then your name actually came up and he wanted me to tell you hey john he said you're still my hero so oh, i got <laughs> to tell you that and another person that wrote in that you got to work with was Tom Cito. I just had Tom on again not too long ago. We went in depth. Wow. And uh, I don't know if you remember because you have so many interactions on social media, but I asked you a couple of weeks ago or maybe about last week, you had posted a little bit of animation with uh, John Smith from Pocahontas. And I said, where does this one rank as far as your career goes for right. accolades, right? right? So you broke it down and you gave me your top four. Um and then that led me to going over and talking to Tom. I'm like, hey, I got John coming on this week. You got any cool stories I should bring up with him? And he's like, one comes to mind in particular. <laughs> so he was <laughs> like, <laughs> so he said, okay, I worked with John on Pocahontas. He did John Smith to Glenn Keane's Poca. When we were going over the end of the song, Colors of the Wind, and I think you know where this is going, uh, song Colors of the Wind, where they are just about to kiss, but stop before their lips touch. We kept teaching them, or he's like, we kept teasing them both. He said, I'm not sure what you mean here. Can you guys act out this scene? So he was talking about you and Glenn, trying to get you and Glenn to kiss out John Smith and Pocahontas. <laughs> oh <my God>. That's <laughs> funny. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I, I like sharing those little things. You got anything you'd like to say to Tom about the, him trying to bring that up? <laughs> Boy, I totally forgot about that. But you know what? It brings, it brings up several interesting ideas. First of all, for an animator to animate something that has authenticity, Julia, it's important that they become that which they are creating on paper. Yeah. So 
Glenn had to be Pocahontas. Whatever the feminine side is that he could muster up, he had to be the Native American princess. He had to be a woman. He had to be athletic. He had to be gorgeous. He had to be all the things that he was putting onto paper and to make it convincing. I likewise had to do my research about John Smith. You know, I found out all kinds of information. I've read his diaries. And so I had to fill myself up with the John Smith experience and become him. Mm -hmm. in order to be authentic with the animation I was creating. Otherwise, it would look robotic and generic, and you wouldn't have cared. And, um, geez, I can, re boy, that's, that's, I'm so glad that Tom re remembers that because he's a historian. <laughs> yes. He'll put that in the book. Long after I'm gone, long, I mean, I've already forgotten about it, you know, but he was a witness to something that is very essential with animators having to become that which they create. So if, we, <laughs> if I had to embrace Glenn and we had to figure out what it was gonna be like to effectively do this kiss, you know? What, I've gotta ask you one personal, I told you I wouldn't get too personal, but who's slipping who tongue, John? Is John slipping <laughs> tongue or is Glenn slipping John tongue? <laughs> hey, no, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you something interesting, you know, um, Glenn is a dear, dear friend, and he is a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he, alongside with my wife and maybe another animator by the name of Ron Husband, he is probably one of the responsible people to bringing me into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. I mean, this is, he's a dear, dear friend. So our our platonic involvement together produced something of a high spiritual nature in that motion picture Pocahontas that we were working on together. And uh, the experiences he was sharing with me could almost equal, you know, what you were seeing on the screen with Pocahontas and John Smith. It mirrors exactly what's going on between those two. It was not only sexual attraction, emotional attraction, but a spiritual attraction too. And because of that, John Smith's heart grew and he is a persona grew. Mm -hmm. So I think that was an important ingredient that happened in the production of that movie. And you know, uh, we, we finished Pocahontas in 1995, I believe. And three, two or three years later, I was baptized along with my wife. Uh, and I've been an ardent Christian and follower of Jesus Christ ever since. So I'm eternally thankful for the Lord bringing people like Glenn, Glenn Keane alongside me. He's amazing. And I'd like to also mention something, too, that um, he's a great teacher. We just um, actually filmed him uh, recently doing a tutorial for my tutorial site. Yeah. Uh, for your viewers, uh, we have a tutorial site called Pomeroy Art Academy. Mm -hmm. If you go to pomeroyartacademy.com, you could see a sampling of what I'm teaching on the uh, online school that I'm that I'm doing right now. Beautiful. And all those links that you have for your blog, your social medias, your websites, right. all of those will be in the description of this video. So you guys can click it and go straight to where John Pomeroy is at. If you want to say, hey, John, man, I love what you do. You can go to his social media and you can follow those links. Um, so we're going to get into the fans questions. We'll get to as many as we can. But the first two, I gave you the pregame for the one. Oh, I gave you pregame for two. Uh, so if you had four plus one, so four people on your Mount Rushmore of your inspirations, they don't have to be animators, but since we're in the animation field and you want to pick some animators, pick some animators. Who are the oh, four? That's a tough one. <laughs> I, I got to say, you know, um, the, the first person, of course, that had to be an inspiration to me with Walt was Walt Disney himself. Yeah. Uh, I started out as a 13 year old wanting to make a, a puppet, a perfect replica of the Pinocchio puppet. And that led me to a book called The Art of Walt Disney. And reading that book a dozen times is what got my spirit excited about wanting to be in the animation industry. And so Walt Disney's gotta be one of the top persons who was an inspiration to me. Another one is the illustrator, American illustrator, Norman Rockwell. Yeah. Aside from animating and moving personalities on paper, I love painting. 
and uh, painting historical subjects. And that's kind of what, one of the things that Tom Cito and I kind of interlocked with because he's a historian. I would read his history notes every day. He would post them at Disney about what happened on this day. And I would yeah. gobble them up and write them down for ideas for future paintings. Uh, Rockwell, interesting character. He was a storyteller illustrator with a paintbrush in his hand. And he'd love to report where the current culture was, where the temperature of humanity was in his artwork, whether it was a Saturday evening post, whether it was a, a calendar art or a, a free piece that he was doing for the Boy Scouts or whatever. Um, I was drawn to that. I was drawn to it. It's interesting. If you go into Walt's office, two of the most prominent pieces of artwork are portraits done in pencil of his two daughters, Sharon and Diane, by Norman Rockwell. So Rockwell ranks up there too. Uh, I would say a third, a third person on that run, Mount Rushmore has got to be Frank Thomas. Yeah, Frank Thomas is uh, one of the nine old men, stage animator. To me, he represents the high water mark of animation acting. Mm -hmm. He was the most careful and analytical animator of all nine, as far as I'm concerned. And I got to work with Willie Reiterman, Eric Larson, who was wonderful, Ollie Johnson, of course, John Lonsbury, bless him. Um, and I got to meet Les Clark momentarily, but these guys were dynamos. Yeah. Frank animated Captain Hook, animated the stepmother and Cinderella, um, animated uh, Baloo the Bear and Jungle Book. He could look at something and analyze it in fine tune and give you exactly what you needed. I remember working on the character Tigger on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2. Frank looked at a little tiny flip of that I created of the scene of Tigger turning away and walking away in the snow. And he actually took it serious. He flipped this thing over and over and gave me several points to correct. I ended up doing that scene about 16 times. It was my baptism of fire. Yeah. And Frank Thomas was my mentor, and uh, it, it, he gave me he gave me the tent poles as far as making sure that the audience always believes what you've created is real. Yeah. That was what I was learning from Frank Thomas. Great animator, great inspiration. Uh, number four would have to be his partner uh, Ali Johnston. Yeah. And who's your so? Partner? There's four great. Great mentors right there. I mean, I've been inspired by Fred Moore. I've been inspired by Bill Teitla. I've been inspired by my old uh, art teacher at Rubido High School, Gary Clem. I mean, there's so many people that have Glenn Keane, great inspiration. Glenn Keane is so funny. In the tutorial that we filmed, he's described, he says, John Pomeroy draws like he kisses the paper with his pencil. I draw, I emboss it with charcoal. You know, we have two totally different conflicting ways of approaching animation. Uh, great inspiration. So Walt Disney, Norman Rockwell, Frank Thomas, Ollie Johnson. There's good, there's four good inspirations. And of course, I've got to mention my wife, Cammie. She's a great inspiration to me. <laughs> I really enjoy that. Uh, you might be the first person that's actually used their wife as an inspiration. So I really appreciate that. I mean, how long have you guys been married? Oh, we're coming up to our 35th nice. wedding anniversary. We were married in uh, December 5th, Walt's birthday, 1987. So we'll be celebrating 35 years together this coming year. Yeah, we just celebrated uh not this Monday. Yeah, it was this past Monday. This past Monday, we just celebrated our 13 year anniversary. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, you know what? It's it, it marriage like having children. God had a, a, an eternal design because of this. And my theory is that you 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 become intimate with the father who created everything by making you a father and caring for a child. That kind of knowledge is just gold. How can you, I mean, there's, there's no other way you can do it besides becoming a father yourself and becoming married to a woman who you love and you devote your life to and you become one out of two. It's absolutely amazing. It really is. It's really nice to have somebody to come home and talk to, especially Amen. when it's a rough day at the office. Well, rough day at the restaurant. All right. So 
this one's uh this one's yeah. always been fun and uh before we'll end it with the book one uh but i did want to tell you i had floyd norman on not too long ago uh yeah. and one of my favorite disney movie of all time has always been uh the jungle book followed really close because we've been watching it at least once or twice a week since the baby was born july 1st of last year uh we've been watching 101 dalmatians almost once a week and I, I've, I've that movie has grown on me so much because i'm such a huge fan of the upa style and that style it, it was it's a beautiful movie it's a perfect movie plus mark davis is my favorite of the nine old men but we're talking nine old men here and uh the story that floyd brought up was because I, I asked him he, he was talking about an ass chewing he had gotten i was like what oh, well, let's, let's put a pin in this one real quick floyd what was the worst ass chewing you ever got and he was like well Ollie called me into the office and I was like, how'd that go? And he was like, about an hour and a half. He was like, he wow. wore me down because he, he was animating on something Ollie had. I don't know. I had to go back and listen to the, uh, to the episode. Um, but he was like, I was animating that something Ollie was in charge of and I was not doing it to his level. And he was like, he oh, called wow. me in there and he broke me down for about an hour and a half. And he was like, that was the worst yeah. ass chewing oh, I've ever gotten. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but uh, he was like, those two guys, he was like, they made me so much better. He was like, everybody on that unit, he was like, if you were not at the top of your game, he was like, you had to go. He was like, Walt only wanted the people that took it the most serious, the people that wanted to come in right. and be the best of the best. And I was like, man, you got to you gotta appreciate that, man. So I really enjoyed uh, the stories and the time I got to, to have with Floyd. Last question, man, and then we'll wrap it up. If you had two books that you would tell every fan of animation or anybody that's in the animation field that they should have on their bookshelves, what are those two books? Ooh, well, for me, that would be, um, first of all, The Illusions of Life by Frank and Ollie. I mean, that's kind of become the animation Bible. Yeah. And then for me personally, my second book would be The Bible. I mean, the Bible is filled with amazing imagination. Mm -hmm. creativity and when I think about it I mean I, I've been teaching over at Lipscomb uh, University with the with Tom Bancroft uh, hired me as part of their animation faculty over there for the last six years every class that I usually start with is I usually start with a prayer and I read to them a excerpt from the book of Exodus about how God commissioned Bezazel and Aholiab with the spirit of creativity, with artistry and craftsmanship. And our gifts are not our own, Julian. Yeah. We get those from him. And uh, I guess as far as, as a mentor, he's ultimately my mentor. I thank God for all of the knowledge I have about creating and about animation from him, who is the ultimate animator, the creator of the universe, of course. Yeah. So. It would be Illusions of Life and the Holy Bible. <laughs> well, there's no better way to wrap this one up, ladies and gentlemen, than he's been John, the living legend himself. I've been Julian. This has been the Wish in My Head podcast, and this has been another piece and a very huge piece of your childhood. Good night. Thank you. My guest next week is one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, Whiskey Lodian. Enjoy this teaser with Sean and Ty. There we find the legend of Pigeon Man. He takes him, gets him healthy, and then we go from there. So, boys, I would love to know your thoughts about this episode. Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Uh, no pressure. To I often, story. like, I, I remember seeing this as a kid, but the cool part about revisiting these episodes is those oh, yeah moments. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I kind of felt like the Pigeon Man at times, like, misunderstood. Um, often, I smell like a bird. Um, and I hang out on rooftops while oh, children shit. tell stories down there. <laughs> yeah, and get their shit everywhere. <laughs> um, it was it was a joy to kind of revisit this episode. What about you, Ty? For me, watching the episode was one experience, and then going behind the scenes and learning about some stuff. Oh man! So I don't know if you knew this, but Chester the pigeon was voiced by Craig Bartlett, the creator. Yeah. And and not only that, but Pigeon Man was uh, basically designed by and was even like a character of the voice actor, uh, what was his name? Vincent Schiavelli. Oh. And so if you look at him, he's got like that super sad looking face. And, and there's another fun fact I, I want to share afterwards. There was some creepy pasta around this episode that I'll creepy share pasta. as we get towards the end. 
basically some like uh conspiracy theories oh uh, oh i know it i know exactly what you're talking about i got you got you got you so as a kid i always wanted to have a five o'clock shadow like that like i don't understand <laughs> how is. it was like a very simpsons-esque five o'clock shadow right uh i was very envious of it and i still can't do it I, it's like a six o'clock shadow now 